And let's talk about one of the consumer-facing names, and that is Whirlpool. They just reported their quarter results this week. It beat the street's expectations for revenue and earnings, but the appliance maker did trim its full-year guidance, and that may have been enough here to spook some investors. Joining us now for more on the quarter, we're looking at losses just about 12% today. We want to bring in Mark Bitzer. He is the CEO of Whirlpool. We also have Brian Sazi, our executive editor, joining the conversation. Well, Mark, it's great to have you here. Let's talk about some of the trends that you're seeing from the consumer, right? We are seeing a lot of pressure on shares today, a lot of that being attributed to the revision that you made for your full year guidance. But what is the, cons I guess, what is your assessment on the health of the consumer right now? Yeah, Shona, first of all, thanks for having me. Um, you know, obviously we reported today uh, Q3 results, which year over year we um, we posted one point of EBIT margin expansion. We had revenue growth and we picked up market share. Um, yet at the same time, as you indicated, we trimmed our full year EBIT guidance um, to basically reflect the current market environment, which leads me to your question um, about the, sent the broader consumer sentiment. What we see on one hand, it's actually a very strong consumer sector. That's for replacement demand. Consumers replacing just a, a, a failed or broken down appliance. What is soft is the discretionary side. And that is ultimately, and we know that, our business is strongly influenced by consumer confidence, uh, mortgage rates and housing. And there's not a lot of momentum coming out of these three elements right now. So the discretionary side is soft and that hurts us on the mix and that hurts us overall in the volume in the business. Mark, Brian here, always great to get some time with you. And look, I, I give you high marks. You and your CFO, Jim Peters, very transparent on that earnings call uh, this morning. Talk to us about the promotional environment. Given what you just said on, on demand and interest rates, do you have to pick up more promotions to move the units that you need to move? Yeah, Brian, I mean, we talk quite a bit about the promotion environment. And basically, the way I would simply characterize it, it's we're basically back to a pre-COVID, what I call normalized promotion environment. So in terms of the depth and also duration of certain, certain promotions, we're essentially fully back to pre-COVID. Um, to be transparent, we expected this to occur maybe one or two quarters later. Um, it now happened already in Q3, but we don't see it going beyond this one. And we actually see right now a stabilization of that promotion environment. Um, the reason why it probably came a little bit earlier is coming back to my earlier point, the discretionary side of consumer demand has been soft and everybody's chasing the same consumer and that's what we see reflected in the marketplace. Um, but we know how to operate in that by, by, by environment. That was pre-COVID and we did very well. And we also, even in this quarter, we expanded share and margin and we continue to intend to do that. What are you hearing from your partners on the housing front, Mark, where you've got these new homes that are being built out and they're giving Whirlpool a call or are already contracted to put a, a Whirlpool, uh, any of the inventory or any of the systems, of course. I, I love a great jacuzzi as much as the next person purchasing a new home. But what are you hearing from them as they're completing some of the homes that they have in backlog and even the new orders that are coming in that gives you kind of an insight into where the home buyer mindset is right now? Yeah, I mean, for probably lack of a better analogy, I would call right now the housing market Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Um, <laughs> and the reason why I'm saying this on is, you know, you have two sides. The new housing, um, you all have seen the order intake is solid because there's just a structure, structural demand, um, strong demand for new housing. Um, but keep in mind, any new order on housing, which we see on the builder side, that translates into an appliance sale only eight to 10 months down the road. It just, that's how long it takes to build the house. The other side is existing home sales, which is a very, very big part of our overall demand. And existing home sales, as you all seen it, are now sub 4 million. That's, you have to go back all the way back to 2010. So you have this odd situation where you have a structural undersupply of a market, which drives positive on new home. Um, but right now there's just not exa enough existing homes on the inventory to turn around because everybody's afraid of losing attractive mortgage rates, et cetera. So that's, these are two very kind of opposing trends right now. Over time and the long term, we state that repeatedly, um, we're very bullish on the mid and long term US housing. Um, US housing has been undersupplied by two or three million units. And at one point, the market will rebalance. Mark, I, th I think the stock today is trading off, in, in my view, what you said on in terms of just promotion, the promotional environment, and some softness and discretionary purchases and the outlook. But do you think the market doesn't understand what you're about to do with your European business? How does that changing of the operations impact your financials in 2024? 
Yeah, Brian, and of course, there's many ways to read a market reaction, but I think one thing, element about the European transaction, I think as long as it's not actually closed, the market to some extent, extent will discount that. Fundamentally, closing that European transaction is a positive catalyst for our cash flow and our company performance. It will lift the overall EBIT margin. And as we indicated, it will improve a cash flow on an annual basis by about two two hundred fifty million dollars. So it's a significant positive, um, but I'm not surprised that the market discounts it to some extent until we have actual closure of a transaction. Now we feel very encouraged by the news which we got from the European Union, um, which cleared it unconditionally. Um, but the CMA in the UK is still a hold up, um, but we expect to have that resolved um, by April next year. Mark, what are you seeing just from a cost perspective, how you see that potentially impacting volumes? And then I guess when it comes to the supply side of it, that obviously was a huge issue for you, many of your rivals going back to the start of the pandemic. Has that essentially stabilized at this point? Yeah, so the supply side is actually reasonably stable. There's still a little bit some tail end on some electronics and some smaller items, but we're basically back to the full availability, which we had before. On the cost side, and we alluded to this one early in our conference call, we actually throughout the year, we see every quarter a stronger cost position. Um, now, to put that in context, we have not fully recovered what co- what the inflation cost us in the prior years. Um, but we, you know, Q3, we took up 300 million of cost. Um, and that is sizable. And Q4, we see even more. So we see good momentum on the cost side. And we do see some of that also carrying over into next year, um, fueled by own cost takeout actions, but also by raw material environment, um, which is more favorable than it was for last year. Mark, uh, lastly, I, I enjoyed how your earnings call started today. It was a video of a new insincorator uh, device or, or, or tool, I'm not, appliance, I should say, and, and was talking about how it can disintegrate chicken bones. I don't own a home, but I think I want one of those. Talk to us about the innovation pipeline for next year. If I do have some extra dollars to where I'm going to buy an appliance and put it on my credit card, even at a higher interest rate. What are some of the innovations from Whirlpool now that we have moved past the pandemic and consumers are back out there being more mobile? Yeah, so, so Brian, we need a lot more time on these calls to explain all the innovation. <laughs> but, you know, it depends, you know, it's, for example, if you start with washers, um, you know, our pet washer program is is a huge success in the marketplace. And if you have a dog or a, another pet at home, um, you will see its benefit. The two-in-one agitated on washing side. But even on the kitchen, what we do in induction or now what we introduce as a flush microwave food combination, these are some really, really strong innovation. And we do see the success of that in the marketplace. As a side note, Brian, and you know, it's it was also in our current earnings call this morning. We did invest more in marketing technology throughout this year, and we will continue to do so because we have a strong pipeline. We have great engineers with great ideas, um, and we will continue to launch wonderful and innovative products into next year. I just need to make sure that I can safely dishwash some wine glasses, Mark. And it sounds like you guys have some good <laughs> solutions for that here. I know Brian Saz is a big fan of the wine. I'm excited well about the here. pet washer. Right, I don't so know what that is, but I got to check out whirlpool.com. I don't know what a pet washer is, but it sounds fun to me. I don't even have a dog or cat. Mark, I, I, di- I didn't call I, it the look, pet I got- washer. You, you, <laughs> so don't put your pet in the washer. <laughs> but it removes pet hair wonderful. <laughs> okay. All right, that is, that is uh, good news to the ears of, of the cat monkey who is at, Very at my home right now. Um, so <laughs> good clarification. Mark, appreciate the time. Mark, Blitzer, who is, Mark Bitzer, who is the CEO of Whirlpool. Thanks for taking the time here today.